Welcome everyone. I'd like to welcome you to this meeting of the Carcinogen Identification Committee. I'm Lauren Zeiss, the Director of the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment. And before I turn this meeting over to Chairman Mack, I'd um, like to cover just a few logistics as well as introduce the panel and the staff. So first, um, the meeting's being transcribed in webcast, so I just want to remind everyone to speak clearly into the mics um, and uh, give your name uh, for the record. With respect to logistics, drinking fountains and restrooms are located out the back door and you turn left, go to the end of the hall. In the event of a fire alarm or any other reason to evacuate, uh, just take the stairs out, down, and uh, go out the doors of the building, and uh, we'll relocate at a site across the street. And we'll be taking breaks periodically for our court reporter. Now I'd like to introduce the Carcinogen Identification Committee. Um, Dr. Mack to my left, uh, then at the far end, Dr. Jason Bush, Associate Professor, Cal State University, Fresno, uh, Lu Ping Zhang, Associate Adjunct Professor, School of Public Health at the University of California, Berkeley, um, then David Eastman, uh, Professor and Chair, Department of Cell Biology and Neuroscience, University of California, Riverside, to my uh, right, uh, Dr. Joseph Landau, Associate Professor, University of Southern California. Uh, to his right, Dr. Peggy Reynolds, Senior Research Scientist at the California Prevention Institute of California and Consulting Professor at Stanford University School of Medicine. And then Dr. Shanaz Darkey, uh, Senior Scientist, California, uh, Pacific Medical Center. So welcome everyone. Uh, and then the OEHA staff, um, Alan Hirsch, Chief Deputy Director, Carol Moynihan Covings, Chief Counsel, uh, Dr. Martha Sandy, Branch Chief of the Reproductive and Cancer Hazard Assessment Branch, um, Karen Ricker, uh, Staff Toxicologist, RCAB, uh, Gwen, um, Gwendolyn Osborne, uh, MPH, Staff Toxicologist, RCAB, um, Meng Sun, Staff Toxicologist, RCAB, and Jennifer Shea, Stock, Staff Toxicologist, RCAB, Julian Lichty, uh, part of the Prop 65 Implementation Group, um, Esther Braha Ochoa, uh, with the implementation staff and Michelle Ramirez with the implementation, implementation staff and Rose Schmitz with RCAP. Um, and so welcome everyone. And um, now I'm going to ask Carol to give some introductory remarks. Carol Moynihan Cummings, our chief counsel. Good morning. Um, so at each meeting, I just do a, a quick reminder on a couple of um, issues. First, um, I wanted to remind you that in your materials in the last tab is the criteria for listing that was adopted by this committee uh, several years ago. If you have questions about whether or not a particular decision um, uh, to list should be made, then you should look at that criteria. Um, that criteria does not include consideration of future impacts of a listing, for example, wh whether warnings would be required or, or particular products might be affected. Um, you may hear about that, but it's not really part of the listing uh, criteria. What you're asked to do is find whether or not a chem chemical has been clearly shown through scientifically valid testing according to generally accepted principles to cause cancer. That's a standard of scientific uh, it's a scientific judgment call, not a legal standard of proof. Um, this committee can decide to list a chemical based entirely on animal evidence. The chemical need not have been shown to be a human carcinogen. 
you don't need to consider whether current human exposures to the chemical are sufficiently high enough to cause cancer. This, the members of this committee are, are very well qualified, were appointed to the committee by the governor because of your scientific expertise and are considered the state's qualified experts on carcinogenicity of given chemicals. So you don't need to feel compelled to go outside that charge. In the event you feel you have insufficient information or need more time to think about the question or discuss it, there's no requirement that you make a decision today. Feel free to ask clarifying questions of me or the other OWEHA staff during the meeting. If we don't know the answer to your question, we'll do our best to find out and report back to you. Do you have any questions at this time? I have a question. In um, the public comments, apparently it was one of the interpretations of this law has to do with chemicals naturally found in foods. Could you describe that kind of distinction? Sure. Um, the, the reference is to a regulation that our um, office adopted many years ago that has to do with um, chemicals that occur, that occur naturally in foods. And um, it's a uh, exemption um, from the warning requirement that is a little bit complicated. It's a fairly long um, regulation, but it, it only applies once a chemical is listed and it only applies to those chemicals that are naturally occurring in a particular food. So um, it's true there is an exemption, but it's not something that would be an issue for you all today. All right, so now I'll turn the meeting over to the chair, Dr. Thomas Mack, professor, School of Medicine, University of Southern California. Dr. Mack. Uh, welcome from me, uh, and now uh, let's get started. First thing I guess I should say is anybody who wants to make uh, comments during the, from the public, and I see all my friends out there, uh, feel free to do so, but uh, go find yourself a blue card and sign up and get ready, and then we'll do it when the time comes. Uh, but I'm sure that uh, nobody's going to have any problems with anything that's said today, as usual. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. And now we start with the staff. Thank you, Dr. Mack. This is Martha Sandy. I will just introduce my staff that will be making this presentation and just clarify that, as you see in the hazard identification document, there's a number of staff that were authors of this, but we'll have four staff making the presentation. We've tried to um, give a, a, a summary overview of the document. We can't possibly go through everything in the document. And first we'll be hearing from Dr. Shea, and then Dr. Osborne, then Dr. Ricker, and then Dr. Sun. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Shea. Thank you, Dr. Sandy. Uh, good morning, uh, I'm Jennifer Shea. And today, we are here to present a summary overview of the evidence on carcinogenicity of Q-marine. Q-marine is a lactone, and more specifically, it is a benzopyrone. The chemical structure of Q-marine is shown here in this figure with the carbon number labeled and lactone structure circled in green. Cumarin is a single compound with a specific Cas number. Cumarin is not the same and should not be confused with other compounds that are sometimes referred to as cumarins that have a different chemical structure. Source of cumarin. Cumarin occurred in many plants such as tonka bean, cinnamon, and sage. Some essential oil also contain cumarin. Cumarin also can be extracted from plant or synthesized commercially. Cumarin has a pleasant sweet odor. It may be used as a fragrance enhancer in perfume and cosmetics, as a flavoring additive in tobacco product, and to mask odor in some plastic and plants. Cumarin is not approved for use as a drug in United States, 
law in 1990s. It was the subject of a clinical trial as a potential cancer treatment. FBA banned the use of cumarin as a direct food additive in 1954 because of a severe hepatotoxicity in animals. Cumarin has been reviewed by International Agency for Research on Cancer, or IARC, and European Food Safety Authority, or EFSA. IARC classified cumarin, not classified abroad as a, its carcinogenicity to human, based on no epidemiological data and limited evidence in animals. EFSA also reviewed cumarin and identified it as a carcinogen in rats, and possibly in mice in 1994. EFSA bets its tolerable daily intake on hepatotoxicity. And this slide provides an overview of this presentation on the evidence on cumarin carcinogenicity. There were no human cancer study. Therefore, the presentation will begin with discussion of a uh, carcinogenicity study in animal. That will be followed by presentation on human relevance, including on pharmacokinetic metabolism, CYP2A6 polymorphism, hepatotoxicity, and common biological pathway identified from toxicogenomic data. Then, mechanistic study organized by IARC key characteristics of carcinogen will be presented. In the case of cumarin, this study covered data on uh, genotoxicity, electrophilicity of its metabolite and oxidative stress. Numerous of, uh, study on CYP2A6 genetic polymorphism and several study on toxicogenomic that are new since IARC 2000 review will be discussed. Finally, we will conclude with a summary of evidence. Now, uh, Dr. Osborne will present the data on animal carcinogenicity. Um, so animal carcinogenicity studies include seven rat studies, four mouse studies, and two hamster studies. Uh, evidence of tumorigenicity comes primarily from these eight studies in rats and mice, which I'll be talking about more in the following slides. So in the three rat studies that I've highlighted here um, are studies of limited study, limited study design or reporting. The first one, by Evans et al., 1989, had one dose level with only five animals examined at the conclusion of the study at 78 weeks and was not, not well reported. The study by Bayer and uh, Gripentrog and Gripentrog in 1973 um, were both published in German and reported bile duct carcinomas in several rats. In later reviews by other author authors, these tumors were described as non-neoplastic cholangiofibrosis. The third study by Hagen et al. reported in 1967 had between five and seven animals of each sex per dose group. It reported liver damage as focal pro proliferation of bile ducts with cholangiofibrosis, fatty change, and focal necrosis. This study did not separately report findings for males and females and was inadequately reported. These studies will not be dis discussed further in this presentation. Uh, at this time, I'd also like to mention the hamster studies here. Coumarin was administered in feed at levels of 0.1% and 0.5% to for two years to males and females. Two uncommon pancreatic islet cell carcinomas were seen in females in the high dose group. Overall, the survival of this study is limited by the small numbers of animals per group and poor survival. In the following slides, I'm going to present the details of the rat and mouse studies by NTP and Carlton et al that I have highlighted here. In an NTP study, male F344N rats were administered Coumarin via Gavage for five days per week for 103 weeks at doses of 25, 50, and 100 milligrams per kilogram. Rare renal tubule adenomas and combined adenomas and carcinomas were observed in the mid-dose group by pairwise comparison. Also, two uncommon renal tubule Oncocytomas were observed in the low-dose group. 
Um, NTP 1993 also conducted a stop exposure evaluation in male rats. In this study, groups of male rats were given 100 milligrams per kilogram coumarin via gavage for nine or 15 months. Some of the rats were sacrificed at the end of exposure while others were kept on study, receiving only the corn oil vehicle via gavage until the end of the 103 weeks. The continuous exposure 100 milligram per kilogram dose group is shown here for comparison. At the end of the 103-week study, a statistically significant increase in the incidence of renal tubule adenomas was observed in the nine-month stop exposure group by pairwise comparison with controls. In the 15-month stop exposure group, two renal tubule adenomas were observed at the end of the 103-week study. Among the animals in the 15-month exposure group that were sacrificed right at 15 months, when exposure stopped, one additional renal tubule adenoma was observed. Finally, I'll note that two rats in the 15-month stop exposure group also had uncommon renal tubule oncocytomas, which was observed at the end of the 103-week study. NTP considered all of these findings and concluded that male rats have some evidence of carcinogenic activity. In female F344N rats, administered coumarin via gavage for five days per week for 103 weeks in an NTP study, a few rare renal tubule adenomas were observed in the mid and high dose groups with a significant trend. NTP considered this to be equivocal evidence of carcinogenic activity in female rats based on a marginally increased incidence of renal tubule adenomas. Carlton et al. 1996 administered coumarin and feed to male sprague dolly rats for two years. The three lowest dose groups were administered coumarin while in utero and throughout the lifetime, while the two higher dose groups were administered coumarin starting after weaning. Uh, the study reported tumors as non-metastasizing and metastasizing cholangiocarcinomas, both of which were increased in the highest dose group compared to controls, uh, as well as hepatocellular adenomas or carcinomas combined. Uh, the authors proposed that the liver tumors were due to exceedance of the maximum tolerated dose that led to hepatotoxicity. Body weight gain was decreased in the three highest dose groups in the study, but this by itself is not an indication of an excessive high dose. Indeed, survival in the two highest dose groups was actually better compared to controls. Carlton et al. also conducted a study on female sprague dolly rats with a similar study design as that in male rats, where the first three dose groups were administered coumarin starting in utero, and the two highest dose groups received coumarin starting only after weaning. Similar to the study in males, multiple types of liver tumors were observed in female sprague dolly rats, non-metastine cholangiocarcinomas and hepatocellular adenomas or carcinomas were significantly increased in the highest dose group compared to controls. Similar to male rats, the observations of increased survival in the two highest dose groups compared to controls and decreased body weight gain do not support the conclusion that the liver tumors were the result of excessive toxicity. In two-year gavage studies conducted in male mice by the NTP, lung and four stomach tumors were observed. There were significant increases in alveolar bronchiolar adenomas and adenomas and carcinomas combined in the high dose group with a significant trend. One and two rare four stomach cell carcinomas were observed in the low dose and mid dose groups. Four stomach papillomas and carcinomas combined were significantly increased in the low dose group by pairwise comparison with controls. NTP considered this to be some evidence of carcinogenic activity in male mice based on increased incidence of alveolar bronchiolar adenomas. In the NTP female mouse study, lung, liver, and four stomach tumors were observed. There were significant increases in alveolar bronchiolar adenomas, carcinomas, and adenomas and carcinomas combined in the high dose group and by trend. Significant increases in hepatocellular Adenomas and adenomas and carcinomas combined were seen in the low and mid-dose group. There was one four st rare four-stomach carcinoma in the low-dose group and one in the mid-dose group. NTP considered this to be clear evidence of carcinogenic activity in female mice based on increased incidences of alveolar bronchiolar adenomas, alveolar bronchiolar carcinomas, and hepatocellular adenomas. In a two-year feeding study in male, mice, male CD1 mice by Carlton et al., lung tumors were observed. 
there were significant increases in alveolar bronchiolar carcinomas in the high dose group with the significant trend. The 2000 IARC summary of this study noted an unpublished company report analyzing mortality adjusted tumor, age, tumor rates, which found no treatment related increases in these lung tumors. We have relied on the information in the published study by Carlton et al., which includes a statement that survival of treated male mice was similar to that of controls. In the female CD1 mouse study by Carlton et al., liver tumors were observed. There was a significant increase in the incidence of hepatocellular adenomas or carcinomas in the low dose group. OER identified four co-carcinogenicity studies. Um, they are all short-term rodent studies ranging from 16 to 28 weeks duration. Uh, three studies were conducted with DMBA, one with benzoepirine. Coumarin was administered prior to and concurrent with either DMBA or BP. One specific tumor type was evaluated in each study as noted on the slide. In all studies, co-administration with Coumarin reduced tumor formation compared to either DMBA or BP alone. It is possible that there may be metabolic competition between Coumarin and BP or DMBA. Coumarin and BP are both metabolized by the same SYP enzyme, SYP2A5. We will now discuss the pharmacokinetics and metabolism of Coumarin. We start with an overview of the human and animal studies that we identified, followed by a brief description of absorption, distribution, and elimination. We will then describe in more detail the metabolic pathways and metabolites of Coumarin. As you can see on this slide, several in vivo human metabolism studies were identified and include multiple routes of exposure. We also identified human in vitro studies that were conducted with liver microsomes, liver slices, and recombinant enzyme preparations. In vivo animal studies were conducted with a wide range of species and via multiple routes. There were also numerous in vitro studies, including studies with skin, liver slices, liver microsomal and cytosolic fractions, and recombinant enzyme preparations. Coumarin is extensively and rapidly metabolized. The data presented here are from human studies. Absorption of Coumarin is generally fast. About 60% of Coumarin applied to skin is absorbed within six hours. Distribution occurs throughout the body, and the plasma half-life for coumarin has been reported to be between 1 to 1.7 hours following oral, dermal, or IV routes. Coumarin is largely excreted in metabolized form, and hence very little coumarin is excreted unchanged. Primary excretion occurs via urine, and about 95% of coumarin is excreted in four hours after oral administration. Excretion is somewhat slower after dermal applications. There's very little biliary excretion in humans. A fecal excretion has been measured only following dermal exposure and amounted to 1% of the applied dose in 120 hours. Uh, by contrast, biliary excretion is higher in some animals. Up to 38% has been reported in rats and about 12% in hamster. Coumarin metabolism um, is similar in humans and animals. <coughs> me. There are two main pathways, 7-hydroxylation and 3,4-epoxidation. When coumarin is hydroxylated at the 7 position, it yields 7-hydroxycoumarin. This reaction is catalyzed primarily by the enzyme CYP2A6, shown here in the red box. The 7 hydroxycoumarin is excreted directly or can be conjugated with glucuronic acid or sulfates prior to excretion. The second main pathway is the epoxide pathway, in which coumarin is metabolized to coumarin 3,4 epoxide, or CE for short. 
the epoxide spontaneously forms orthohydroxyphenyl acid aldehyde, ortho HPA for short, after undergoing ring opening of the lactone ring and decarboxylation. These two metabolites, coumarin epoxide and ortho HPA, are reactive electrophilic metabolites. Ortho HPA can be further oxidized by aldehyde dehydrogenase to orthohydroxyphenyl acetic acid, ortho HPAA, or it can be reduced to orthohydroxyphenyl ethanol, ortho HPE. Ortho HPE in turn can be oxidized back to ortho HPA, thus replenishing the pool of ortho HPA. Instead of undergoing further oxidation and reduction reactions, coumarin 3 4 epoxide can also be detoxified with glutathione and be further metabolized to coumarin 3 mercapturic acid. Uh, some products have been observed in animals but have not been yet been looked for in humans. They are shown here in bright blue. In other minor pathways, coumarin can be hydroxylated at other carbon positions, yielding a variety of hydroxycoumarins shown here. It can also be metabolized to orthocoumaric acid, which in turn can form 4-hydroxycoumarin, an orthohydroxyphenyl propionic acid. It is unclear if human gastric intestinal microbes can biotransform coumarin in the gut to form 3,4-dihydrocoumarin, an orthohydroxyphenyl propionic acid, as has been shown in rats. Uh, I would like to come back now to the epoxidation pathway shown here in the large red box and talk a little bit about toxicokinetics and the formation and clearance of the electrophilic metabolites, CE and ortho-HPA. There's some indication from in vitro studies that differences in the kinetics of ortho-HPA formation and subsequent oxidation to the acetic acid, as well as detoxification reactions, may determine the ultimate toxic effects of these metabolites. Mice appear to catalyze the oxidation of ortho-HPA to ortho-HPAA in the liver more efficiently than rats, which is evidenced by the amount of ortho-HPAA formed in mice, uh, which can be up to 41% of the administered dose, but is only 12% in rats. Mice also have a faster clearance rate for the oxidation of ortho-HPA to ortho-HPAA compared to rats. Lastly, while both mice and rats reduce ortho HPA to ortho HPE, this is only a major reaction in rats. It has been suggested that a cycle of oxidation reduction from ortho HPA to ortho HPE and back may contribute to slower hepatic clearance of the toxic aldehyde in the rat. Furthermore, the extent and kinetics of additional detoxification reactions such as conjugation with glutathione may also determine the extent to which electrophilic metabolites bind covalently with cellular macromolecules in a given tissue. The purpose of this slide is to point out the importance of the genetic polymorphisms of the human CYP2A6 enzyme here in the red box to the overall coumarin metabolism in humans. In some, but not all, humans, the 7-hydroxylation pa pathway is the main pathway of coumarin metabolism. Uh, the human CYP2A6 is a highly polymorphic enzyme, and hence the metabolic pathway is primarily determined by an individual CYP2A6 genetic variant. Uh, this is evidenced by the wide differences in amounts of 7-hydroxycoumarin versus ortho-HPA, uh, measured as the acetic acid, um, excreted in human urine by different people. In some individuals, 7-hydroxycoumarin can constitute up to 92% of urinary metabolites. Conversely, in an individual who is homozygous for a loss of function CYP2A6 variant allele, 
the amount of 7-hydroxycumarin measured in the urine can be less than 0.02% of the applied dose, while the amount of ortho-HPAA accounts for nearly 55% of the total urinary metabolites. Clearly, this is a metabolic shift that allows for greater formation of electrophilic metabolites. We will now hear more about the CYP2A6 polymorphism, its distribution in human population, and its implications for human health risk assessment in the next few slides. Dr. Soon will take over. As we mentioned in the metabolism slides, in humans, CYP2A6 is the main enzyme for coumarin 7 hydroxylation. 7-hydroxylation is considered a detoxif detoxification reaction compared to the epoxidation pathway in which electrophilic reactive metabolites are formed. CYP2A6 is a highly polymorphic gene. To this date, there are at least 45 allele variants with many subtypes within each designated allele. The distribution of these alleles varies greatly across different ethnicities and populations around the world making certain individuals more susceptible to loss of the enzyme function of CYP2A6. Different allelic sequences result in different levels of enzyme activity. Individuals with decrease of function or loss of function alleles can be poor coumarin 7 hydroxylators. This table summarizes the human CYP2A6 variants reported in the literature. The first column lists the alleles, the second column lists their coumarin 7 hydroxylation activity compared to the wild type enzyme. And the third column shows the types of genetic changes that lead to the polymorphisms. Allele A or 1A is considered the wild type and codes for the fully functional enzyme. Compared to the wild type, there are alleles that have increased activity, similar activity, decreased activity, or no activity. For several alleles, their coumarin 7 hydroxylation activity is still unknown because it hasn't been tested. The genetic changes listed in the third column include gene conversions, duplications, and single nucleotide polymorphism, or SNP. This slide shows you an example of the genotype-phenotype correlation in three studies conducted in the Thai population. The investigators determined the CYP2A6 genotype of human volunteers, gave them each a coumarin tablet orally, and measured their urinary excretion of 7-hydroxycoumarin, or its conjugate. The first study, in the first study, four out of 192 volunteers were homozygous for allele 4. In the second study, four out of 120 had this genotype, and in the third study, one out of 194 had this genotype. Individuals homozygous for LEO4 in these three studies excreted an average of between 1% and 15% 7-hydroxycumarin compared to the wild type. This gives you an idea of the consequence of carrying two copies of a loss of function allele. This slide illustrates the distribution of two CYP2A6 alleles reported in different populations around the world. Allele 4, which is a deletion allele and leads to no enzyme activity, is shown in green. Allele 9, a decrease of function allele, is shown in orange. The X axis lists the populations that were genotyped, and the Y axis is the percentage found in each population in the genotyping studies. Each bar represents a range of frequencies found in the population based on multiple studies, with the bottom of the bar starting at the minimum of the range and the top of the bar showing the maximum of the range. A dot means the frequency came from one study. Overall, there is a diverse distribution of these two alleles. Going from the left, you can see that the frequencies in African individuals and African North Americans are similar as shown by the overlapping of the first two green bars for Leo 4 and the first two orange bars for Leo 9. Between East or Southeast Asians and e Asian North Americans, the frequencies for Leo 4 also overlap and go up to over 
the lack of an orange bar for Asian North Americans means allele 9 was not tested in this population. The rest of the populations shown here contain different levels of these two alleles. Defective CYP206 alleles are present in all of these populations tested, and the carriers of these alleles are the subpopulations that may lose part of their coumarin-7 hydroxylation activity or even all of it. This slide presents data from a newly published study by Joe et al. on the distribution of 176 different cytochrome P450 alleles in over 56,000 unrelated individuals. CYP2A6 was one of 12 genes analyzed. Sequencing data came from the Exome Aggregation Consortium, and linkage information came from the 1000 Genomes Project. Exome sequencing doesn't provide information on the deletion alleles, such as allele 4 and 5, and duplication alleles. So in those cases, the authors used frequency data from published literature. Using a different color for each allele, this figure shows the relative contribution of different variant alleles in the five major populations tested. The pie charts do not include the wild type allele. The different color combination for each pie chart represents the genetic variation from one population to another. We can see the most frequent variant for Europeans is allele 35, for Africans is allele 17, and for East Asians, South Asians, and admixed Americans of Mexican and South American industry is allele 9. These three are all decrease of function alleles for coumarin 7 hydroxylation. CYP206 variants 2 and 4 are loss of function alleles, and others shown here are decrease of function alleles for coumarin 7 hydroxylation, except for alleles 14, 21, and 28. CYP206 polymorphism is an active research field with many new studies being published each year. Further information on frequencies of CYP206 variants is provided in Appendix B of the Hazard Identification Document. To conclude, certain CYP206 polymorphisms lead to the metabolic shift towards epoxidation and production of the reactive electrophilic metabolites coumarin 34 epoxide and ortho-HPA, which can bind to cellular macromolecules. Evidence for the shift is seen in human in vivo and in vitro studies, as we further discuss in the hazard identification document. Besides polymorphisms, CYP2A6 activity can also be compromised by non-genetic factors, such as diet or drugs, and can be saturated by exposure to high-dose coumarin. Carriers of loss or decrease of function alleles may be more vulnerable to coumarin toxicity mediated by the reactive metabolites of the epoxidation pathway. A number of clinical trials and case reports with coumarin observed hepatotoxicity in a significant fraction of the people treated. The extent to which this involved loss or decrease of function CYP2A6 alleles was not well studied. Next, Dr. Xie will take over. Thank you. Now, uh, let's switch gears to, um, sorry, uh, mechanistic data. I'll start with genot uh, genotoxicity data followed by toxicogenomic data. Cumarin has tested positive for a number of genotoxicity endpoints in studies in bacterial, fungi, cell-free system, plant cells, mammalian cell in vitro. While cumarin is generally negative in salmonella, it induces base pair substitution mutation in the presence of a metabolic activation in salmonella strain TA100 in multiple studies, and was also positive in another modified strain, uh, TA7002, which detect TA280 transvergence. Cumarin did not induce HPRT or GPT locus mutations in Chinese hamster ovary cell, but it induced chromosome abbreviation and sister comity exchange in Chinese hamster ovary cell and in onion loop tip cell. 
cumarin-induced micronuclei formation in human lymphocytes, and in two studies using human hep hepatoma cell line. Cumarin did not induce unscheduled DNA synthesis in human liver slices in one study. But in Aspergillus nidulin, cumarin induced chromosome instability. In E. coli, cumarin did not cause DNA damage, but it inhibited DNA excision repair. In cell-free system, cumarin has been shown to bind to single and double-stranded calf Simon's uh, DNA. However, in in vivo study, no positive genotoxicity finding has been reported for the four genotoxicity endpoint assessed to date. Uh, sex linkage recessive lethal mutation in Drosophila, micronuclear formation in mice, unscheduled DNA synthesis in red liver cells, and in one unpublished report, DNA covalent binding in red liver and kidney. Four cumarin metabolites has been tested in a limited number of genotoxicity assays. The two most uh, electrophilic metabolites, cumarin 3,4 epoxy and also HPA, have not been tested. Positive finding has been reported for two cumarin metabolites. 7 hydroxycumarin and 3 4 dihydrocumarin. 7 hydroxycumarin did not induce mutations in salmonella or unscheduled DNA synthesis in red hep hepatocyte, but it did induce expression of the ADA DNA repair gene in E. coli. Was weakly positive in the induction of a chromosome abbreviation in Chinese hamster ovary cell. Form DNA cyclo adduct with cymine and cytosine and DNA interstrand cross link in synthesized DNA after photo irradiation. 3 4 dihydrocumarin uh, did not induce mutation in salmonella and did not induce chromosome abbreviation in Chinese hamster ovary cell or micronuclei formation in mice, but it did induce sister chromatid exchange in Chinese hamster ovary cell. 6,7-dihydroxycumarin and also HPAA were tested in only three types of assay, and each were negative. Moving on to toxicogenomic study. Toxicogenomic data are new since 2000 IARC review. The data source are from six studies conducted in rodents and two in vitro studies using human hepatocytes. Several of these studies reported that cumarin alters two cancer-related biological processes or pathway, namely a pathway related to glutathione metabolism and oxidative stress response. OEHA conducted a gene oncology, or GO, and Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genome, or CAG, pathway analysis using the microarray data from one red liver in vivo study. This analysis identified multiple cancer-related biological processes or pathway altered by cumarin. When we compare this pathway identified in our analysis of in vivo red liver study with altered cancer-related pathway reported in one of in vitro human hepatocytes, we identified several common cancer-related pathways altered by cumarin in both red liver in vivo and human hepatocytes in vitro. This common cancer-related pathway include those related to nucleic acid binding, metab metabolism of xenobiotic by CYP enzyme, and oxidoreductase activity. The slide lists the essential cancer-related pathway enriched by cumarin generated from OHIHA's GO and CAKE pathway analysis using microarray data in red liver in vivo. The left column lists the pathway that were enriched by cumarin treatment. 
and the right column shows their link to one or more of the key characteristics of a carcinogen identified by IARC. The pathway highlighted in yellow are enriched in both rodents and human. The pathway listed in the top part of the table are linked to three critical carcinogenic characteristics. Electrophilic metabolites. The corresponding pathway are metabolism of xenobiotic by SIP enzyme, nucleotide binding, genotoxic. The corresponding pathway are nucleotide binding, base excision repair, and DNA replication. And inducing oxidative stress. The corresponding pathway are glutathione metabolic process, oxidation reduction process, and response to oxidative stress. This slide summarizes other mechanistic studies. There are data on reactive oxygen species production and glutathione depletion. In addition to the toxicogenomic data that we just heard, traditional toxicology studies have shown that coumarin increases reactive oxygen species production. In addition, 6,7-dihydroxycoumarin, a coumarin metabolite, was shown to increase mitochondrial reactive oxygen species in HeLa cells. The depletion of glutathione has been observed in rat liver in vivo, in freshly isolated rat hepatocytes, and in primary rat hepatocyte cultures. In addition, the formation of coumarin metabolite-derived glutathione conjugates has been demonstrated in human liver microsomes. The effects of coumarin on cell proliferation is not clear. In one study, coumarin increased the mitotic index of rat hepatocytes by 1.4-fold. However, many other studies have shown that coumarin and its metabolite 7-hydroxycoumarin inhibited cell proliferation and induced apoptosis. In the next two slides, we will give you a summary of evidence, starting with animal studies. There were multiple tumor findings in rats and mice. The first tumor type is renal tubule tumors seen in male and female F344N rats. These renal tubers, tumors, while mostly benign in the Coumarin studies, are rare in rats. There were also hepatocellular tumors seen in male and female SD rats and in two strains of female mice. B6C3F1 and CD1 mice in the low dose group. Liver cholangiocarcinomas were also observed in male and female SD rats. In the male rats, significant increases were seen in both metastasizing cholangiocarcinomas and non metastasizing cholangiocarcinomas. Lung tumors, specifically alveolar bronchiolar tumors, were seen in male and female B6C3F1 mice and in male CD1 mice. Lastly, increases in four stomach tumors, namely combined squamous cell papillomas and carcinomas, were observed in the low dose group of male B6C3F1 mice. Four stomach squamous cell carcinomas are rare in male mice. This slide summarizes evidence related to Coumarin's possible mechanisms of action and its human relevance. There is evidence to support three possible mechanisms of action. First, Coumarin forms the electrophilic metabolites Coumarin 34 epoxide and ortho-HPA, which have been shown to bind covalently to microsomal proteins in rats and humans. These metabolites and their subsequent clearance and detoxification reactions may play a role in coumarin toxicity based on data from in vitro studies. Coumarin can also induce oxidative stress. It depletes cellular glutathione as a result of the formation of coumarin metabolite-derived glutathione conjugates. This reduction or depletion of the glutathione pool may shift the cell's redox balance and impact the cell's overall ability to detoxify additional reactive oxygen species, leading to oxidative stress. 
Evidence for increases in reactive oxygen species comes from studies in HeLa cells as well as in vivo and in vitro toxicogenomic studies. The third possible mechanism is genotoxicity. As we heard from Dr. Siet, Coumarin has tested positive in a number of in vitro and cell-free genotoxicity assays. Finally, we'd like to present a summary of the evidence regarding the human relevance of Coumarin's carcinogenicity. The primary enzyme for Coumarin 7 hydroxylation in humans is the highly polymorphic enzyme CYP2A6. Populations around the world carry certain allelic variants of this enzyme that are associated with either no enzyme function or reduced function. When Coumarin 7 hydroxylation by CYP2A6 is compromised, the metabolic shift leads to increased generation of Coumarin 3,4 epoxide and ortho HPA products from the epoxidation pathway. Most of the studies on CYP2A6 polymorphisms are published after the 2000 IARC review and can help us identify vulnerable groups within each population. In addition to findings on human CYP2A6 polymorphisms, a number of clinical trials and case reports indicate that Coumarin causes hepatotoxicity in susceptible individuals. There are also new findings from toxicogenomic studies identifying several common cancer-related pathways altered by Coumarin in both rat liver in vivo and human hepatocytes in vitro. With this, we conclude our presentation today. Thank you. Thank you, guys. That's very interesting. a very interesting presentation. Now let's uh, see if uh, the committee has any questions for the staff. David? I have a couple of questions. Um, first of all, thank you for the presentation. And I encourage to see that you're using some of this toxicogenomic data. Um, although I realize it's a challenge to sort of interpret, and that's the way I approach it. But I am curious, in this toxicogenomic data, typically, typically they're looking at changes in gene expression, correct? So when they're showing evidence of nucleotide binding, this isn't reactive species binding to DNA like we think about in toxicology. This is nucleotide binding as far as to gene expression changes. Is that correct? That's correct. So this really isn't evidence of electrophilic species at all, and probably not an evidence of genotoxicity either. It's just saying it changes gene expression. I mean, that's my interpretation. I haven't looked at the data, but that's the sort of things that are picked up in a gene expression profile wouldn't tell you if it's electrophilic or anything like that. Is that correct? So, oh, David, um, what we explained was the analysis is you're using GO and KEG pathway analysis, and they're linking changes in genes to different biological processes or pathways. So these, they saw genes uh, linked to pathways associated with uh, the res cellular response to nucleotide binding that were changed. That, that, that's what this is. Yeah, but that, so you're that's correct, not it's not it. an apical endpoint. We measured nucleotide binding, no. It's looking at genes associated with certain pathways and processes. But I think this is the difference between sort of how a molecular biologists would look at things and how a toxicologist would look at things. Nucleotide binding usually refers to binding that alters gene expression versus what we think of as toxicologists, it usually refers to covalent binding to, you know, to DNA or RNA. So I think it's, for me, I mean, I think it's certainly fine and reasonable. I don't, I'm not necessarily convinced that's evidence of electrophilic properties of the compound. That's. Sorry. Uh, was the um, Coumarin 3,4 epoxide mutagenic, strongly so, and dose dependent mutagenesis in some of the systems studied? response? Yeah. Um, no. No. Uh, 
you're asking if the 3, 4 epoxide was ever tested. And no, it has no, not been. No, that it was hasn't. Not on that yeah. metabolite slide, we said that is one of the metabolites that yeah. wasn't tested. And how about uh, uh, ortho HPA, the aldehyde ring open metabolite? It hasn't been tested. And have they tried to radio label them and see if they bound covalently to DNA yes. and made adducts? Um, bound to microsomal proteins, but haven't tested for DNA. To proteins, but not DNA. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have a follow up uh, question on the microarray data. How sustained are these changes? So I understand that some of this is in vivo data where the animals were treated with coumarin and then their livers were collected and um, microarrays were done to uh, examine gene expression. Uh, how sustained are these changes is my question. Have they done different time points uh, after treatment? Yeah, they do uh, several different time points um, from uh, one day up to two weeks, several different time points. But the data I use uh, for the uh, cake and go an uh, 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 analysis is the data um, they collect after one day treatment. So it is a very short term change, um, epigenetic change. One day. One day. Within one a day, day, the early changes that happen include what's on um, the cake pathways. Yeah, th that's the data I show. But in the paper, they did do the study uh, from one day up to 28 days. So uh, I also thank you for the, your uh, extensive review. As an epidemiologist, I have a much simpler and more fundamental question. And so my understanding is most of the animal evidence is based on exposure via feed or gavage. Um, and that we're talking about uh, what it's not clear to me whether we're talking about natural or synthetic coumarin, but in the IARC report, there's an extensive discussion of the use of um, coumarin in personal care products. So um, my question is, uh, you talked about potential for um, oral versus um, um, uh, dermal exposure. Um, given that this is prevalent in per personal care products, uh, still, I presume, and I presume we'll hear something from the fragrance association since they provided a very extensive um, comment on this. What is the opportunity for exposure pathways in humans? And do you have any sort of sense of, of that in terms of uh, pathways of exposure for potential risk? Just, well, so again, your task is hazard identification. Um, and that's what our document focuses on, not exposure assessment. But as we discussed um, in the document, it is present in foods naturally. It occurs naturally in some foods. And it's used, whether it's the same compound, whether it's synthesized or extracted from a plant. Um, it's used in perfumes, personal care products, and, and other things. So we would. Presume that the routes of exposure would be dermal and inhalation and oral. Thank you. Another question. This has to do with, um, for example, the, the kidney tumor data, incidence data that was seen by the, in the studies done by the National Toxicology Program. This would be on like slide number seven, slide number nine. You have different denominators there for the animals that were studied. And I am I would guess that in some, you're looking at the total number of animals, and in others, you're looking at the number of animals that survived beyond a certain period. This strikes me a little bit of sort of cherry picking data, um, in that, at least with the kidney tumor instance, number nine, so before this. So on this one, if I recall, NTP did not consider this statistically significant in the trend test, their trend test, because they worked with the 50 animals per um, dosage. But apparently, you've worked only on it, those that survived beyond a certain period of time. If you go to slide number seven, it's even more apparent. 
So the data for the adenomas, you've got 55 animals, but for carcinomas, you have 37 animals in the control. And the fact that you're using different numbers of animals in your denominator strikes me as unusual for the same study. Um, so we have a, a standard way of, um, of calculating the denominator where we look at the, um, the day of the first tumor, the, the first tumor was seen, and then we count how many animals were alive at that point. And so we do that for each of these, um, for each of the tumor types. Here. So you don't do, so we do it for each tumor type and not in general, because then that seems odd to me because you've got 55 animals for adenomas, but you only have 37 animals in the control for carcinomas and vice versa, all the way through the thing. Yeah, well, we want to make sure it's that the, all the animals lived until a certain time point when they had the chance to develop the first tumor. Let me, let me add, um, this is a standard way that US EPA uses as well when they have the information. So with NTP studies, we have all the information. We know the exact day that an animal died and was assessed with a tumor. And the, the, so we do this for dose response. We do it for hazard identification. We've been doing it for eons, years. Every document you see where we have the data. So for the particular tumor type, in this case, renal tubular carcinoma, it's the first day that any animal in any of the groups, controls are treated, uh, was found to have a renal tumor tubular carcinoma. We say that's any animal that lived up to that day was then at risk of getting that tumor. If they died before that first tumor was seen, they're not at risk. So we don't count it in the effective number. And so you can tell that for renal tubular carcinomas, the, the numbers are lower. That means um, the carcinoma appeared later in a later day. So there were fewer animals alive in all the groups. The renal tubular adenoma occurred earlier, apparently. And we have the day of occurrence in our HID, I'm sure. And then when you combine the two tumor types, you're taking any animal that either had an adenoma or a carcinoma. So based on the first day of the of either one of those tumors. So the, the denominators in that combined row are equivalent to um, in the adenoma row. So let me, t so, um, so in the carcinoma data, it's pretty apparent because there was only one animal that had a carcinoma. So you're saying when that animal developed carcinoma, 25 milligram per kilogram dose, that there were 37 animals alive at that time in the controls, 35, 25, 19, 13. And presumably, you didn't do this with Carlton at all study because in that case, you didn't have the data because there's massive mortality in those studies. So um, they didn't report the data. And when we when they don't report the data, we have to use the number of animals in the in the groups to start with. That's correct. A couple much less sophisticated questions. Um, did uh, she, when you were reading through the literature, did you come across any source of Coumarin that was extensively used in South in Southeast Asia or in South China? Uh, cassia is the only one I could think of, which is the cinnamon. It's called Chinese cinnamon, which is actually now more Mexican cinnamon. Um, but uh, but that's but there's nothing else, I guess, because tonka beans are South American, not uh, Asian. So as far as you know, there's no real extensive use of coumarin of plants which can which contain coumarin in, in okay. Southeast Asia or South China, right? Coumarin also uh, contained in a lot of uh, in a lot of personal care product, cosmetic and perfume. So like uh, uh, most perfume, 80% of perfume contain coumarin. I, so I can't understand. Yeah. Personal I'll, product. I got, I'll get her to repeat what you said because I'm really deaf. Okay. So lots of perfumes contain oh, yeah. coumarin. Yeah. Um, and I think Martha can add in terms of foods in Southeast Asia. Yeah, I was really asking about food. I understand about perfumes. Um, and I can say that um, I, I can't answer to Asia or Southeast Asia, but there are so, there are many other plants, lavender, and yeah. it's in our documents, right. with woodruff, and a lot of other sources of coumarin in natural plants. So I, I can't tell you specifically for that part of the world. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, second question is for Dr. Osborne. Um, I'm, uh, I find the distinction between metastasizing and non-metastasizing cholangiocarcinoma to be kind of an odd distinction because if you kill the mice in two years, you may not have found, given them enough time. So I don't think that's a real distinction or it may well not be a real distinction. It may simply be a matter of how rapidly it metastasizes. So that's one, an observation question. Uh, so that seems reasonable to you. Yeah, we um, reported, this is how the authors reported it. So we didn't have the separate data for metastasizing or not. Okay, the next question is, I don't know what an oncocytoma is. Oncocytoma? <laughs> Sounds like a, a cancer of the cell, but I, I have no idea what it means. Do you know what the cell of origin of an oncocytoma is? Yeah, it's a renal tubule tumor. tumor. It, um, it's also, the cell of origin is, is the renal tubular cells. It's a very uncommon tumor type um, in so NTP sort of studies. Other and unknown. Pardon me? Other and unknown. Um, it's uncommon in NTP studies, and it's actually the first time I think we've seen one reported. Okay, now the final question is, uh, I'm really interested in the gene-environment interaction that, uh, that uh, the CYP26C, uh, whatever it is, 264 produces. And my question is, uh, does this distinction, uh, is there any evidence that this distinction makes a big difference between a urinary exposure of the metabolites or uh, hepatic, uh, uh, in other words, does it get in the bile? You pointed out that 1.5%, a very small percentage, gets excreted in the bile, and, uh, and yet there's a lot of hepatic toxicity. And so I would wonder if, if the... Uh, if if the SIP enzyme might make a difference in how it's distributed in uh, discretion, is there any evidence of that? Um, from what that we've seen, I think um, in the presence or absence of SIP2A6 uh, polymorphic polymorphisms, the urinary excretion remains the major um, metabolism pathway. But as far as you know, the hepatic excretion doesn't vary much. I understand that that the urinary excretion is going to be the vast majority, but 1.5% is very small, and if it doubled or tripled, it might be important. No, no, no evidence for that. I don't think anyone's looked. That's the problem. Okay. I saw my... I have a very simple question. Just try to cl um, clarify a couple slides. Slide number 24. Um, <clears throat> so, sub 2A6. Um, I know the, on the slide 25, the next slide is focused on the Joe 2017. So, that's all from that study. So my question is the slide before, the slide 24. Is that the slides already include the information in the uh, Joe 2017 or not? Um, because I know you, you found the, uh, yeah. the other new study later. So that's, yeah. can you um, classify? Yeah, information from this slide, slide number 24 comes from the HID table 17. We just represent in the in the graphic um, form instead of in the tabular form in the HID. Okay. So the frequency in this figure comes from um, groups of studies that OE have reviewed, including Joe 2017 or not? Not including Joe's. Okay. That's yeah. my question. Okay. Good. Mm -hmm. Number two question. Also, just clarif uh, clarifying the slide number 30. It's about the OE has um, go a cake pathway analysis. Is this table, the data come only from the one study from the, what are called the? Yohora 2000. 2000, yeah, yeah, so correct. That's only from that one study. Yes, right? yes. Thank you. I'm actually very glad Oyeha this time at least trying to using 
the comparative uh, toxicogenomic database trying to provide some additional information. But I would uh, save my comments on that later when we get there. But thank you. Asking for uh, public comments, and Jay is the only person who has provided a card. So, Jay, would you like to give us your five minute presentation? Thank you. I'm Dr. Jay Murray, and speaking on behalf of the International Fragrance Association North America, which uh, submitted written comments uh, to you on Coumarin. So, uh, and thank you for reading the submission, as well as all the other uh, uh, documents you had to read. So, Coumarin is before you today uh, because no authoritative body has formally identified it as causing cancer. Uh, in fact, an authoritative body, NTP, uh, conducted one of the cancer bioassays in animals, as you've seen, but NTP did not find enough evidence of carcinogenicity for Coumarin to be listed uh, uh, under the authoritative bodies mechanism based on NTP's interpretation of its own bioassay. Okay. No epidemiologic studies of Coumarin in cancer have been identified, so it really comes down to the animal studies. So if I could have the first my first, you got it up there, first and only slide. Um, there are two key cancer studies uh, in animals, as you've already heard. It's the NTP and the Carlton studies. Uh, and they evaluated Coumarin in mice and rats, both of them. Uh, NTP concluded that there was clear evidence of carcinogenic activity in female mice, but not in male mice or in male or female rats. The clear evidence in female mice is due primarily to statistically significant increases in lung adenomas and carcinomas at the high dose, uh, which is uh, a tumor of questionable relevance to humans. In male mice, there was an increase in benign uh, but not malignant lung tumors at the high dose. And this is important because your guidance criteria says the evidence must clearly show the chemical causes quote, invasive cancer in animals, unquote. In male rats, there was an increase in benign renal tumors without a clear dose-response relationship, and in female rats, no increase in tumors at any dose. So switching to the Carlton study, there was an increase in liver tumors in female mice at the low dose only, and according to IARC, no statistically significant increase in tumors in male mice when adjusted for mortality. In rats, there was no increase in tumors except at the high dose, which greatly exceeded the maximum tolerated dose. So, uh, for example, during the first 13 weeks of the study, the high dose male and female rats gained 266 and 102 grams less weight respectively than the control males and females. By the end of the study, males and females weighed 252 and 229 grams less, respectively, than the controls. Um, for, for those who may not do animal studies, those are massive differences in body weights. And in this day and age, the high dose would have been terminated because it drastically exceeded the maximum tolerated dose and out of concern for animal welfare. You wouldn't see this these days. The high dose should not be considered scientifically valid testing according to generally accepted principles. Now, IARC evaluated these studies and concluded, as you heard, Coumarin could not be classified as a carcinogen, group three. Um, the HID also included information on CYP2A6 uh, polymorphisms and genomics data, which you, you heard today. Um, I, you know, I'm, a, I'm a fan of genomics data myself and have been involved in uh, several studies now looking at genomics data, but uh, uh, it, it provides little additional information of value for hazard identification. Um, 
looking at uh, genes where you see upregulation in glutathione metabolism or oxidative stress, that's not unique to chemicals that cause cancer. It may be a key characteristic, but you see it in lots of chemicals that don't cause cancer. Uh, regarding genotoxicity, the weight of the evidence does not show coumarin is genotoxic. You just heard that uh, coumarin was negative in every single in vivo genotoxicity study. Uh, it was shown not to bind DNA in liver and kidney in Sprague Dolly and F344 rats. So in conclusion, the only clear evidence of carcinogen carcinogenicity is the increased incidence of alveolar bronchiolar adenomas and carcinomas uh, among high-dose female mice in the NTP bioassay. Clear evidence of a carcinogenic effect in one sex of one species in one study is not enough to list coumarin. The overall scientific evidence does not support a conclusion that coumarin has been clearly shown to cause cancer. Thank you. I'd be happy to try and answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Jay. Is there anybody who has questions for Jay? Um, just a, a question. Well, first of all, of course, IARC's classification is with regard to humans, uh, class three classification. Yes. Um, I, so. If, if coumarin is in a personal care product, it's in my shampoo, is that included under the rubric of fragrance? So that is considered trade secret, so a consumer wouldn't know um, that it's in a particular product or how much? Um, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. I, I, <laughs> I, I listened to your question earlier, and you know, while I'm here on behalf of the International Fragrance Association, I'm a toxicologist. I'm really not an expert in fragrances or, or perfumes. and and Dr. Reynolds, to go back to, to uh, your first comment, uh, IARC uh, looks at both the animal and the human evidence, and IARC can classify a chemical uh, as a carcinogen on the basis of the animal studies. So, you know, uh, you know, the, you know a 2B classification. So they looked at these animal studies and said, not enough to classify it, and gave it a group three. Okay, thanks, Jay. Just a clarification, I think I considered the evidence limited in animals, so the way they include. Yes, there's limited evidence in experiments. Anybody else have questions for Jay? Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Oops, sorry. Come to comments from the committee. So I'd like to take it in the following order. I'd like to hear from Joe, and then from David, and then from Dr. Zhang. And then anybody else who wants to weigh in. So Joe? Okay. Um, Jay, I did read your comments. I read all the public comments first before I looked at the HID. Um, this is an interesting compound. You know, it's metabolized by cytochrome P450. You've got two potential uh, approximate carcinogens. One is the 3,4 epoxide. Uh, the other one is, is the ortho HPA. Um, so that was interesting and, and gives a lot of insight into what the compound is doing. I looked through the same database that Jay just discussed, and I have a little bit of a different take on it. In, um, let's see, table three. Um, the kidney data was interesting for the renal tubule adenomas. The tumors go from one to six to eight and then to five. And I think that's an increasing dose response, which then plateaus out. Um, the renal tubule carcinomas are not so robust. The, com the combination of the two together, uh, again, goes from one to six to eight to five. And the trend is not significant, but there are increases in tumors there over the control. Um, I'm going to skip through some of this real quick. I also looked at the, uh, the clangio carcinomas were interesting, um, and in particular the non-metastasizing ones. Uh, they go zero at the control to zero to zero to zero, then to one and then to 31. And that trend t test is statistically significant at P less than 0 0.001. And the high dose is 31 tumors out of 65, and that's statistically significant too. Um, 
Then the hepatocellular adenoma and carcinoma combined in the male sprague dolly rats starts out at two and it controls and it goes two, one, one, then six, so that's an increase, then 29. So, uh, and that 29 is statistically significant and the trend is statistically significant. Um, then the liver tumor incidence in the sprague dolly female rats uh, shows a similar thing with the non-metastasizing cholangiocarcinomas going zero in a control, zero, 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 22 out of 65. That uh, high dose um, event is uh, statistically significant. The trend is statistically significant. Uh, and then the hepatocellular adenoma or carcinoma goes zero in the controls to zero, 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 then one, so it's going up a little bit, then 12 out of 65. The high dose in is statistically significant. The trend is statistically significant. So I uh, added that data. Then the male B6C, 6C3F1 mouse uh, data uh, is interesting too. There's a high background in the controls for the alveolar or bronchial carcinoma. It goes from 14 and then it uh, drops to 8, then 14, then 24 out of 45 at the high dose. The trend is statistically significant, P equals 0 0.001. And the uh, alveolar bronchial carcinoma is, is very low, uh, not statistically significant for trend tests. Uh, the combined goes from 14 to 9 to 15 to 24. So as a marginal increase at, a, at the next to the highest dose and a high increase, 24, uh, 25 uh, tumors out of 45 mice, the trend is statistically significant. The high dose is statistically significant. And I could go on, but to make a long story short, uh, I'm going to say that I look at this data and uh, when I evaluate the genotoxicity database, yes, a lot of that is in vitro work. It's a little bit tougher sometimes to get in vivo positive genotoxicity data. It's not so easy, but there is positive data there. So when I add this data together in my mind, uh, I would say I certainly could not ignore this data. It's, it's too much. Uh, it's positive at uh, a number of doses and trends are positive in some areas. So uh, my recommendation is to list this compound as a carcinogen. Thank you, Joe. David? Um, thanks. I have a little bit different opinion than Joe on some of these things. Um, let me just talk a little bit about how I approach this. Um, initially, when I read through the document, uh, wow, well, this is overwhelming evidence. But then as I started reviewing in more detail, and some of this is looking at other authoritative bodies, I realized this is actually a really challenging compound um, <clears throat> because the evidence is not nearly as compelling as what it might appear at first glance. And so let me talk through some of these studies and put it in a context. Um, so on the rat, let's say the kidney tumors in the rat seen in the NTP bioassay in the male rats, essentially, you know, these are described as rare tumors. I don't like that description because you have tumors seen in the controls. So they're actually uncommon, I think is a better descriptor of this particular tumor type, and that happens over and over again. But in essence, these, these tumors, there's, again, a non-significant trend with a significant increase seen at one of the intermediate doses. This is occurring in the context that these animals all have sort of chronic nephropathy, 100% um, of the animals, I believe. And so there is a real debate in the toxicology community on the significance of um, renal tumors when you have this chronic nephropathy in rats, it's seen. Um, so it, this particular, and this happens for the males and the females, so you've got sort of questionable. The NTP considered this to be some evidence of carcinogenicity, and I would probably agree there's some evidence there, but it um, becomes a challenge in sort of the interpretation. If we go on to the rat study, the Carlton studies, and I'm usually not one to dismiss studies of having exceeded the MTD, the maximum tolerated dose. Part of that becomes because of the way that maximum tolerated dose is actually defined in its origin. But it, I think it is clear when you get a study where the dose is sufficiently high that basically um, the animals are under tremendous physiological stress in some respects. In this case, they are. I mean, the body weight, and indeed the whole study has some serious problems because 
In the female arm of this study, I think the survival in the controls was 26% by the end of the study. So it's not, you know, the, the study is a real problem. And on the rat part of the Carlton study, IARC reviewed this and considered it inadequate to, to use for doing an evaluation. So they kind of dismissed it. They did indicate it was kind of peculiar, actually I found it very odd, that they dismissed one of the trends based on mortality adjusted statistical analysis that they were aware of, that industry had conducted, but they apparently didn't see it, which was a very odd thing for them to do in my mind, but that's um, a different thing. So again, all the, all the tumors, and a very high tumor incidence in these bile duct tumors, in the rats, but it's at the highest dose only. And that's sort of this, what you could easily argue had exceeded a maximum tolerated dose. Personally, I didn't consider the rat portion of this to be scientifically valid. There's, the survival is such, and the body weight changes are such that I would not put weight on the rat portion of the study. Um, and that's really basically both on the males and females portion of it. The, um, the other rat studies were old studies, as they indicated, were not um, adequate for making the determination. So if we go down into the other, looking at the mouse now, we have the real strong, clear evidence of carcinogenicity in the female mice for lung tumors, 13-fold um, increase, so a very strong response. Um, and so that's the strongest evidence as well. The second piece of evidence is in the female mice, there's an increase in liver tumors. Um, and although the trend is not statistically significant, the two intermediate doses have high values of liver tumors, and they're well outside, outside of the NTP historical control. So the NTP considered this as one of the reasons for considering that um, tumorin caused cancer in the, these female mice because of this high, high level. So that's the clear evidence on those two different tissue types. Um, the liver could go some that clear, but I think because it's so far above historical controls, I'd consider that to be a real evidence. When we get into the four stomach tumors, um, again, NTP concluded these may be treatment related, but they, so I would consider sort of limited evidence uh, the Carlton one, you have a two times, two-fold dose really increase in lung carcinoma seen. So you know what the highest dose this is in the mice now. And in this case, the body weight changes were not terrible. There was an 18% decrease in body weight gain in the highest dose um, male mice. And again, this was discounted by IARC because of unpublished um, mortality-adjusted data. In the female mice, um, again, there's a significant trend seen at low dose. The authors indicated that this was within the historical control values, but they didn't provide any data. Um, so it's harder to evaluate that. As I said, the hamster study was inadequate, and there was a study in baboons, pretty unusual, but it was an unusual, inadequate length. The length was not sufficient. So we've got kind of a mixed pattern there. Let me. Um, move on and talk a bit about genotoxicity because this is an important component. I found the genotoxicity um, data, the in vitro, just in general summary, there's some evidence that Coumarin causes genotoxicity in vitro, but it's a very weak in vitro genotoxin. If you look at the um, results in TA100 in the rat liver S9 induced, it's under two-fold increase, which generally is sort of a a rule of thumb in industry, if you don't have more than a two-fold increase in TA100, that's not considered significant. But NTP considered one trial to be equivocal, the other one they had a 1.9-fold increase, so they considered that to be, you know, evidence of, um, that was mutagenic. The other studies, the two other supportive studies are both abstracts, so you don't have the data there. And then the third one is in a substrain of TA100 in which most of the substrain was negative, but they did have a positive result, and they didn't describe a, the magnitude of the increase. So there's a weak increase in CTA100, um, so in mutations in bacteria, there's no increase in mutations in mammalian cells. If you look at the 
uh, evidence on chromosome aberrations in vitro. It's again, that it's very weak. In fact, the concentrations, if you figure it out, the, the maximum dose for testing currently by OECD standards is 10 millimolar. The effect is seen at 11 millimolar. So it's outside of the range you would test uh, normally. That's, that's the maximum test range for that. And that's a weak increase as well. One of the earlier studies by um, Sanyal et al., I don't know how they got statistical significance. They essentially have a 30% increase in micronuclei above control. Um, and they used a Kruskal-Wallis test and they don't have enough replicates in my mind to pick up significance. So I don't know how they did that. So, I mean, it, there is an increase there, in it, but it's sort of suggestive. Um, so down the line, if you get into the old chromosome damage in the plant cells, these are studies from the 1940s and 1950s. There's no data presented. The quality is really marginal. In some cases, they essentially say, rarely chromosome fragments were seen. And that's what's the basis for you know, the positive results. So for me, the in vitro stuff is, there. yeah, there's some evidence genotoxin in vitro, but it's pretty weak genotoxin. When you go in vivo, it doesn't appear there's any evidence for um, essentially mutagenicity in Drosophila or chromosomal damage in uh, the bone marrow cells and peripheral blood cells um, in mice, negative in the UDS assay, which is a little unusual. If you think this is causing point mutations in the liver, the UDS assay is basically a very insensitive assay. But where it should pick up things are things that cause point mutations in the liver of the target organ. And they didn't pick up anything. And the other thing is that it was negative in, um, for covalent binding in the liver with, and the kidney in both Spragdali and Fisher 344 rats. So there's no evidence for genotoxicity in vivo for this. Uh, moving on briefly to the um, metabolism work. It's correct that, I mean, I would agree that there's two different basic metabolic pathways. One predominant is the one where you have the epoxide form in the rodents. That is a very minor, relatively minor pathway in humans. But because there are people who are polymorphic for CYP 2D6, I guess, or 2A6, 2A6. Anyway, for this 2A6, there's a percentage of humans, probably roughly 5%, that would not metabolize during, through the, the one pathway and they would go th most likely through the epoxide pathway. So I can't, I can't conclude that this is only seen in rodents. There's, and there's evidence in human clinical trials of liver toxicity as well. So that's a long, um, and the other thing I should say is that EFSA did review this. They considered the evidence sufficient. I think they considered that evidence of carcinogen sufficient in rats, and but with supportive evidence in mice, I would probably flip that around um, in my evaluation. So I guess the bottom line on me is this is really a judgment call. I tend to think that we've got clear evidence in the female mouse, both in the lung and the liver. I think there's enough evidence when you start looking around sort of the overall pattern that there's probably sufficient evidence to list. However, in my recommendation, I would request that the OHIA really sincerely look at this as an, for evidence of genotoxicity, because I do not think this is, would be considered a genotoxic carcinogen. And that was a conclusion of EFSA. They've gone through like four reviews of this, and that's their conclusion. It's a non-genotoxic carcinogen. Um, so that's my sort of summary. I can answer questions if you have them. So on the fence, but falling off. Yeah, I'd probably lead, lean towards listing, but just barely I could go either way. And I, the one thing I forgot to say on the uh, genomic evidence, and Jay kind of summarized this, is that the two pathways that seem to flag are glutathione changes and um, reactive oxygen species. And that's common for other chemicals that we haven't listed. Sedimentophen, if you're looking at sedimentophen, it would show those same patterns almost for sure. So um, that for itself is not sufficient evidence for me to push it over the edge. And the one last thing is all the animal studies we looked at were the same ones as looked at by IARC and EFSA, I believe, too. Thanks.
as Joe indicated, this coumarin, it is a very interesting compound. When I first reviewed the uh, Yiha document, um, so to me, I feel the animal data looks, to me, is pretty strong. You know, multiple species, multiple cancers, you, you know, in, um, I mean, multiple different organs. And the dose response seems, you know, observed in um, quite a few studies. But what really bothers me is the genotoxicity data. Um, seems most of the genotoxicity data is from in vitro. Um, that's a positive. And um, in vivo, you know, either not test tested or negative. So that bothers me. But as what I just, uh, you know, when I was asking um, Oika's staff for the questions, but what I'm really glad to see is um, I think this document, um, the staff really took a trouble to really uh, review each of the toxicogenomic studies one by one, and the list of the, all that, and uh, then use the, choose the one of the study and the, did their own the comparative toxicogenomic data based analysis. So I'm really happy to see that. As what uh, my chair assigned me for the major role is trying to um, leading the discussion on the toxicogenomic data. And then you already see uh, a couple of our uh, members raise these questions. So um, could I ask my chair? Um, uh, so last night, I did some, a little extra work. So I actually have a few slides if I can, if I could be allowed to present here. I got just a few slides and whom I should yeah, give yeah. to. Okay, sorry. So when she's loading the slides, I could tell you just a little story. How could I get there? I, I was not really intentioned to do this. Okay, everything is by accident. Um, it's just the one um, PowerPoint presentation has my name at the end. Okay, uh, so when I loaded this here, <clears throat> Actually, last week, I just came back from uh, um, Lyon, France, um, for an uh, IRA yeah, working group uh, meeting. So right after I came back with all the jet lag, we had this lab meeting. Uh, so the lab meeting, I should have presented by our new poster. I mean, is that OK? I'm just telling a little bit of story. How did I get to this? So the new poster named Linda, and the present um, so she actually has a bioinformatics background and presented a, um, a study we're trying to use in the existing the database or software, try to see how could we apply this 10 key characteristics, trying to predict any chemicals, especially unknown carcinogenicity chemicals, if we, we can predict by using this 10 key uh, characteristics. So she presented data to the two I are known like a group of one carcinogens, which are, we are very interested. And uh, randomly, she also chose the two, um, group three from our, um, on the ARAC list chemicals. So um, one of them, she has no clue about the tumor. I'm on this committee. But it's just when she gave a presentation, she has a very light line that, by the way, I also try, besides the known carcinogens were interested, I did two non-carcinogen is really listed on the ARAC group two, uh, three. It's non-carcinogenic. You know, so one of them is cumarin. I didn't realize until two days ago. She actually did that. So then when I, was looking, oh, she already did a crumb run. So yesterday I was asking, could you send me your slide? She, she said, what do you have done? So I thought then I just got it yesterday afternoon and then last night I trying to take a look. I thought it would be good to, to just show a few slides. So last night I trying to combine all what she did and, and uh, summarize in a few studies. So that's um, 
The reason I thought of this is, number one, is totally independent from what OIHA has done with the um, comparative uh, toxicogenomics database, CTT, okay? So that's number one. Number two, and the, and when Linda did this, it is considered as a lung carcinogen because it's from the group three, from ERIC listing. So, and also I looked at the, when, when I was re review, I reviewed the documents before, I see what the OEHA did is one by one from toxicogenomic studies. Here, what I'm trying to do, and that's what we're trying to do is Combine everything. We're not only focus on the six studies. Whatever the studies we can find from this CTD database. Okay. So let's just start. So that's just a two few days ago we did that. Uh, I can. I don't have control. Do I have control? Okay. So what we are, first, what is CDT? It's a public available database, and it is robustic, and it, you know, the database was really trying to aim to um, help us to better understand the interactions between exposure to the chemicals, your interest, or, and the link to the human disease. So that's what uh, this basically generally database, oh, oh, sorry, to do, uh, okay, yeah. So, so first thing is you find all the genes related with your chemical of interest. Then you find the genes related with the disease you're interested. Then from this CDD database, uh, is that okay? I'm just gonna give you a little background and how, how we come up with that the chemical and then the disease association. So that's basically what. It, so what's the goal of this little one? So we really try is identify the genes and the pathways and the key characteristics from the cumulin exposure. So the, I'm going to just walk you quick through with a workflow. It's a three steps workflow. The first is getting to the CDD database you trying to obtain all the genes first, all the genes associated with the chemi chemical of your interest. In today's case, it's cumulin. The second is try to obtain all the genes associated with disease of your interest. So today, let's just focus on cancer, okay? So that's why. And when you have these two sets of genes, you want to see if they have interactions or not. If they have no interaction, period, you don't have to do anything, right? So which means chemical X doesn't have any association with disease Y. But if there is the uh, association, you will want to see what are these genes overlap. So that's first step. Second step, when we're trying to now load these genes, or overlap genes, into another software called the Cytoscape. So in Cytoscape, they have a specific app called the Blue Go. And I know you're using the Go, but here in Cytoscape, it's called Clue Go. So it means what are these genes to tell us? What's the clue? Okay, what is the clue we got from this gene? Okay. So in here, what they're telling us is first gave us a visualized gene and gene interaction network. So you can make a sense of what's going on. Why, you know, just now gave me a list of genes and see what's, what's the interaction. And what is this really trying to look into is cluster of genes in a functionally grouped network. That's what they were, this software could tell us in the way it's actually is identified the pathways, which really link the chemical induced disease gene, you know, involved with this, um, specific exposure with the enrichment analysis. So the third step is getting to the specific pathway called YK pathway, which is really based on the biological process and biological pathways 
and to really, this one could uh, help us to identify the key characteristics of the human's carcinogen. So that's the goal. Identify genes, pathways, and the key characteristics. So that's my basic intro. What do we got? From, so now I'm not even talking about everything. So from the CDT, identify the total of 65 studies and involved with the any camera genes, you can see the species as human or mice study or rats. But in some studies um, from the Sinatra four studies with camera genes, but they didn't even specify what the species is. So total of 65 studies we identified from the CTD. And, oh, sorry, I'm, my computer doesn't, let me close it, I don't get that. Okay, <laughs> so second we, we look at the genes. So you see from the, from the table, right? So from 65 genes, identified total of 276 genes, but only 222 is unique genes because some genes will overlap with different species. So there's 222 genes, it's related with coumarin, but from the data, uh, database, there are more than 3,000 genes related with neoplasma, so related with all cancer. How, ma how many of them overlap? You can see. 96 genes, they overlap. And that's about 43% of cumulant genes was related with any type of cancer. So in this term of neoplasmas, includes with cancers of liver, lung, kidney, you know, what, and many more other types. We also did separately with just the liver cancer. You can also do just liver cancer, but today I'm only going to show you the data from cancer in general. So, second step is what are all these 96 genes, overlap genes tell us. We put this 96 gene name into this pathway analysis by using Klugel. So this is all the pathway. Each dot represent each pathway. How many of them? So there are 44 pathways identified. But when you look at the 44 total pathways, actually it's only 52 genes from the 96 overlapped gene really involved in the identified pathways. So which means another 44 genes which are not really involved in any pathway, okay? So at least now we see what, what the big dot all the big dots means they have more genes involved in this pathway. Small dots maybe only one or two genes. So that's so you can see what making sense. Next, what's on the pathway? I don't mean you have to see. So I'm just going to show you the top 20 pathways. You know, from the YK pathway analysis. Okay, so you can see the top one actually is this called the NRF. Um, and one and two is all involved is either NRF2 or NFE2L2. It's also an, an NRF2. Okay. And also the oxidative stress pathway is also um, on the top of five. So look. Okay, actually fine. I'm just trying to show you that. i just using oxidative stress, okay? What we have is in the database, 61 genes involved in oxidative stress. But a six gene was identified from the coumarin related gene, okay? So then let me just quickly show you what the data come up. The, all the green gene, that's the six genes identified from the coumarin involved in oxidative stress. So. And also oxidative stress is one of the 10 key characteristics as a number five in the, in the list, which the table, I think, the document has it. So then when we are just looking at all the 10 key characteristics and how many pathways involved with each 
cases. So here you can see the oxidative stress is the number one, actually is involved with the 10 um, pathway, 10 cumarin related pathways, okay? And uh, then the first one, metabolic activation, but I think that's because mostly they are involved as P450 uh, and, and so on. So if you want to have detail, each one they give you, you know, a table of the list of what genes involved in which pathway. So I'm just uh, showing here. So what we actually learned from this is you can see the red, two red, that's a pretty um, straightforward and, and uh, we are really see oxidative stress, metabolic activation, like uh, David you have question about, but actually, you know, from the data analysis, it actually seems to show uh, mostly affected. But maybe it's a different uh, the question. It's yep. only the genes involved with. But actually, you want to Mine was think about that. Binding, right, right. Which it's, you have nothing it's a different for genotoxicity. Yeah, right. Yes, okay, we can get to why. Okay, it's a good question. Why genotoxicity pathway is zero? If you think, most of the genotoxicity data coming from chromosome aberration, micronuclei, comet assay, you know, or, or, or uh, mutations, right? Except that the mutations, you may have identified specific genes. Other things do not involve with specific genes. For this database, it's all based on specific genes has been tested with coumarin exposure. So that's why the genotoxicity pathway is not showing here. Unless we have specific, the genes, you know, like a mutation, which would be involved in the database. That's my best explanation. We can discuss about that. So I, oh, I almost finished, then we can okay, no. come back to this. So what we got here is we see five key all the red and the blue, five key uh, characteristics are involved in the potential carcinogenicity of a tumor. So that's basically, summarize up from the CDT database, what we have seen, tumor genes, 222, and the cancer genes is 3,152, overlap genes in 96. From 96 genes, we're trying to you know, in the 96 genes, we look at the pathway analysis, and what you see is 44 of genes, they are not involved in, with any pathway. 52, yes, and then pathway involved with tumorin is 44 pathways. And then when we did the YK pathway analysis, but which I have to say, because we ran out of time yesterday, we only did a very crude analysis about the uh, key characteristics. So that's five of the 10. So we didn't have a chance to do the detail. So that's basically what I have got. Thank you so much. I don't know if I made it in 10 minutes, but actually, just to tell you, you the whole story. Do you think we should risk it or not? <laughs> what? Um, okay, so here, here is, I have to say, when I read what OEHA provided me in the chapter 3.3.7 and the 3.3 and the 8, I feel on the fence. Because, because it's a, each study, right? You have to think and right. you have to go in through. Each way you gave you different gene list, so what's really making sense? So I'm actually glad we finally, you know, as really is by accident, you know, my lab, you know, uh, postdoc, new postdoc did this, and uh, which allowed me at the very last minute, actually I had a last night working really hard to put the, this few slides together. And then after I did this myself and I look at the general abroad database, that make me more convinced. Yeah, right. from genes, pathways, and the key characteristics from all three different directions, I would vote to this. Is that what you want to ask yes, me? Yeah, okay. Jason, do you have anything to add? Sorry, we're sharing. Good sharing. I have a slideshow as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm teasing, 
teasing. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so let me give you my interpretation uh, of this. Um, thank you to OEHA for uh, compiling the HID document, and thank you to the Consumer Specialty uh, Products Association, Council for Responsible Nutrition, and International Fragrance Association for submitting your comments. Um, I read and evaluated your concerns refuting the Coumarin report. Um, like David, when I first looked at this, um, I thought it was uh, clear. But as I dug into it, um, I found that the, uh, the animal data, uh, multiple rodent studies across multiple tumor types, um, less, less convincing. Uh, one thing I found particularly disconcerting was the, the presence of the lung tumors and you know, possible extrapolation to you know, to use in tobacco products or vaping products. But looking at the uh, hepatocellular uh, carcinomas, the cholangiosarcomas, uh, um, I attributed that, while the data was compelling, the, the CYP2A6 uh, polymorphisms, um, I contributed uh, that more to the cytotoxicity uh, rather than carcinogenicity. And, you know, uh, cholangiosarcomas are derived from uh, connective tissue in the hepatobiliary area. And to me, that uh, is more uh, a result of an inflammatory response. Uh, and it was interesting to see your uh, interpretation, uh, having that uh, chronic inflammation, those, uh, that particular pathway. Yeah. Pathway thing right, happening. right. Um, you know, and, and while there are some clinical studies out there, I, I, I found uh, showing the hepatotoxicity, I think it's cytotoxicity, and um, you know, any connection with clinical studies was more tenuous. Um, the genotoxicity observations, uh, you know, I think were suggestive of DNA repair inhibition, but beyond that, uh, I wasn't particularly convinced of any of the other uh, mutational information. Um, I was also interested in the cell transformation information, uh, but there was only limited studies there. I think one study on uh, human fibroblasts showing uh, marginal cell transformation with Coumarin alone, and that only occurred at, at high dose. Um, in terms of the keg and go pathway information, and I, I have uh, quite a bit of experience with this on my own from uh, my proteomic work, um, it is microarray data, a single study, and I think we have to be careful there. Uh, you know, often this, this data can be misleading, and my interpretation was that it, it warrants further validation rather than uh, you know, uh, making too much uh, of that data. So I find myself you know, concurring with uh, you know, the other authoritative bodies. Uh, that, uh, for me, the weight of the evidence yeah, at this point is, is too limited, and I would uh, vote not to, uh, not to list at this time. Could I ask a question? Sorry. Um, so, Dr. Bass, you, I thought it's in <clears throat> the mutation data, is, uh, but my understanding, I thought the mutation data, they're pretty um, convincing, at least from the AMS test in the in the, um, you know, the bacteria test, the, they are repeated and consistently come up with this one specific target. And, and uh, so, is it, do you, you don't think the bacteria data counts? Uh, I put less weight on the uh, AIMS test than looking at uh, eukaryotic cells. And, and for that, I wasn't convinced. Yes, uh, with all the comprehensive reading material we were given, I was not on the fence at all. It was very, very helpful, very clear to me as to how I feel about this, this um, chemical. L especially looking at the mechanistic data, um, it is very clear that the cytotoxicity, as Jason pointed out, um, goes along with the, uh, the, the necrosis, the atrophy, the nephropathy, all of that seems to make so much sense because that's what cytotoxicity does. It kills cells. And uh, because the 
the evidence on cell proliferation is very inconsistent as well in vitro, that the agent, uh, the chemical does not induce cell proliferation. In fact, um, it induces apoptosis. And uh, when you look at all the genes that are going uh, up, uh, they are apoptosis genes. So it's not even inducing evasion of apoptosis, which is why, or cell death, which is why, and it's not causing cell proliferation. So obviously you are having cell death going on. In, and the in vivo and the in vitro data are quite compatible. So even if there is some level of genotoxicity, if the cells are not able to uh, survive past that, how are they going to make cancer? They, they cannot be cancerous. So um, in my opinion, the, the, the evidence really points to the fact that this may be a nasty chemical at high doses in terms of toxicity. But there's really no strong evidence mechanistically for carcinogenicity. Well, I just have to say, as a mere epidemiologist, it was very helpful to hear these discussions. I, I was primarily focused on the animal studies, and I felt like that the evidence was extremely mixed and fragile. Um, and so I was completely on the fence and did not feel strongly to, to list based on that. Well, uh, I, <clears throat> everybody's on the fence, and of course uh, I, but, uh, but I'm going to fall off. Uh, <clears throat> the thing that impressed me the most was the uh, cholangiocarcinoma, uh, um, uh, because even at very high doses, it means that there's a potential for carcinogenicity. I don't pay too much attention to the in vitro studies when that's true, because I don't know what the mechanism is, but in the empirical piece of information from the rats at least, it causes carcinoma. And our mandate, unlike that uh, at IARC, is not to decide for sure that it causes carcinoma in people. It's to whether it causes cancer. That's the way the wording is in the legislation. So I have to say that I think that that's real. And I'm motivated by something else, uh, which may or may not be pertinent, but it sticks in my mind. Cholangiocarcinoma is not a very common cancer in the United States. It's very rare, in fact. But there's one place where it is the single most common lethal cancer. And it's more lethal in that place than hepatic carcinoma, which ought to be the most legal cancer. In Kongkheim province in northeastern Thailand, this is where the, the cholangiocarcinoma is the most common cancer. And the reason it is, is not due to coumarin, as far as we know. And from what I'm told, there's no reason to think there's any coumarin there. But both of my questions were related to this, because uh, cholangiocarcinoma is a carcinoma of the in people and in rats as well, a carcinoma of those bile ducts that are within the liver, not after the liver, but within the liver. And in Southeast Asia, that carcinoma is caused, quote, unquote, one of the causes of it is a parasite of fish that people eat raw in northeastern Thailand and Laos. And the organism, the, the parasite, is a fluke. And the fluke lives in that, those, uh, in those, in those uh, uh, bile ducts within the liver for up to 20 years. And the presumption is always that it causes uh, cholangiocarcinoma by virtue of simple abrasion and uh, injury to the cells of the bowel duct. But we all know that for the most part, that's not enough to cause the cancer. At least it isn't for most kinds of carcinoma. So one always assumes there must be something else going on. And I don't know what it is, and I'm sure it's not coumarin, but cholangiocarcinoma is an important carcinoma. And even if it's caused in rats by very high doses, to me it means that coumarin can cause cancer 
under some circumstances, and I have to assume it probably can elsewhere as well. So my vote is for listing. Uh, so what do we do now? Make a vote, make a vote. All right, so let me go to the right words to make sure I don't upset Carol. Okay, the question is, has Coumarin been shown through scientifically valid testing according to generally accepting principles to cause cancer? Um, may I have yes votes to that question by hand raises? One, two, three, three and a half, three and a half, going That's for three and two. three quarters, four. Four out of... So let's count again. Maybe sure I missed. That's only one, two, three, four. Okay, the vote is not. Well, let me just ask now the other question. Uh, all those voting no, please raise their hand. One, two, four yeses and two noes. Uh, five votes are required to add a chemical to the list. So. On, and we have an abstention that's irrelevant. Uh, so uh, we do not vote to list the uh, Gomer into the list. Did I count myself? I must have. <coughs> four to one. Four, four, four to two. There's seven. Okay. All right. So we're finished with that particular item on the agenda, correct? The court report. Carol? I'm just thinking that we need to take a break, at least for the reporter. I know we've got other stuff, and we'd like to go quickly, but I think we need to at least take yeah. a short break. Could, could we do 15 minutes? Would that work for you? You want to do that instead of How taking a minutes? lunch break? 15 minutes? Uh-huh. Okay. Okay, thank you.
Can we uh, reconvene, please? is a consent item in which the committee is asked to consent to the update of the California Code Regulations, Title 27, Section 27,000. The list of chemicals which have not been adequately tested as required. So this list is basically a list of chemicals which are both uh, under question for both, uh, uh, both carcinogenicity and uh, um, I'm blocking on the word. Reproductive, Reproductive uh, toxicity. So uh, the committee is just uh, asked to to give their consent to maintaining the same list. Uh, there are really only a couple of uh, carcinogen potentials on the whole list. Uh, Carol, do you want to say something? Right. So, so um, as Dr. Max said, this is a consent item. We're going to try it this way. Um, at this meeting, and so um, if you, let me see. If you recall, you, you received a document that looks something like this um, from us where um, it was a staff report that uh, ahead of the meeting, and we also posted this report on our website that um, is shown in this slide. There's a copy available at the back of the room for the public if anybody w wishes to see it. The specific item you're voting on is amendments to that are um, shown in section six of that report. This item is on the agenda for your consent. This means you just need to vote yes or no concerning the changes that WEHA proposes to make to the section 2700 list of chemicals that need further testing. And this is based on information obtained by WEHA from the Department of Pesticide Regulation and US EPA. The section 2700 list is informational and has no regulatory effect. Um, next slide, or, that's me, next slide. Okay, so for purposes of this committee, there's only two changes to the list that are proposed in the staff report. You can see these on this slide. <coughs> the, <coughs> excuse me, the other changes to the list will be considered by the DART IC committee at their meeting later this month. OEHA staff is recommending that you vote yes so that we can make the necessary changes to the list described in the staff report. Does anyone have any questions before Chairman Mack requests a vote? Doesn't seem to be any question at all, Carol. Okay, good. So do I go ahead and ask for the vote? Um, Based upon the recommendations of the OEHA staff report, should Section 27,000 of Title 27 in the California Code of Regulations be amended as indicated in Section 6 of the staff report? Would everybody voting yes please raise their hands? Unanimously uh, approved. Uh, no votes for no, so the result is six votes yes and uh, no votes no. So now we go on to the next item on the agenda. Sorry, that was seven. Seven, yes, zero, no. Seven. Because there's seven. I'm going to do that. That's basically, we've come to the staff update, so we're talking about the Prop 65 chemicals that have been added since November. I can read them, but I guess somebody else. Yeah, please. Go ahead, my dear. Okay. Uh, since your last meeting, 
We've added a total of five chemicals administratively for causing cancer and uh, four for causing reproductive toxicity. The first slide here shows that for cancer, the following chemicals were added, glyphosate by the labor code listing mechanism, pentabromodiphenyl ether mixture, DE71 technical grade by the authoritative bodies listing mechanism, and NN dimethylformamide, 2 mercaptobenzothiazole, and tetrabromobisphenol A by the labor code listing mechanism. The second slide shows that for reproductive toxicity, bismodegib was added for all three endpoints, developmental, female reproductive, and male reproductive toxicity via the formally required listing mechanism. Pertuzumab was added for the developmental endpoint, also by the formally required listing mechanism, and perfluorooctanoic acid, PFOA, and perfluorooctane sulfonate, PFOS, were both added for the developmental endpoint via the authoritative bodies listing mechanism. The next slide has the chemical under consideration for administrative listing, vinylidene chloride. The far right column indicates the date of the notice intent to list. That was September 22nd, 2017. And this next slide uh, shows that since your last meeting, eight safe harbor levels have been adopted in regulation effective July 1st, 2017, a no significant risk level has been adopted for styrene, and maximum allowable dose levels have been adopted for ethylene glycol ingested and for oral exposures to each of the six triazine compounds. On this last slide, as you can see, we've also proposed safe harbor levels for three chemicals. No significant risk levels have been proposed for malathion, glyphosate, and vinylidene chloride. And now I'll, think, now I'll turn things back over to Carol. Thank you. Now we go on to litigation. Right, litigation. Um, all right, so um, the good news since our last meeting is that um, there have been no new lawsuits filed against OEHA. Now there will be just because I said that, but there, um, the existing um, cases, uh, active cases are all now in the Court of Appeal. Um, the only uh, trial court cases pending are derivative and one that's not a Prop 65 case. We did settle the um, the case Syngenta versus Oeha that related to the no significant risk level for chlorothalonil, so that case has been dismissed. Um, <clears throat> and um, all, all the other cases have been uh, fully briefed, we expect uh, to hear at some point from the Court of Appeal for um, a hearing. Um, they are the uh, American Chemistry Council case that uh, challenged the listing of BPA as a developmental toxin. Also the American Chemistry Council case challenging the listing of DINP. Um, the Syngenta case challenging the listing of the triazines, a case filed by Mateel um, challenging our lead uh, maximum allowable dose level, the challenge by Monsanto to the listing of glyphosate. So all of those cases we expect at some point to be heard by the Court of Appeal. If I had to guess, um, the most likely one to be heard um, early next year is the Monsanto case because they have um, successfully requested uh, a um, early hearing date on that case. We don't know exactly when it's going to get set. It's in the fifth um, district court. So does anybody have questions? Glyphosate is in Roundup, yes. Yes. Dr. Yes. Uh, usually uh, with the uh, administrative listings, I usually look at them and I usually agree with them because they've all been so thought out already. So I don't say anything, but the uh, last set, you know, they sent out, I agree with them all, so I didn't say anything to you. Is that okay? Or do you, uh, I think that's what most people do, probably. Right. Well, it's our practice to send you notices when we do administrative listings, and you always have the option as individuals to comment on whether or not you think that that 
um, listing is appropriate under that particular listing mechanism, but you're not required to make a comment. So you should assume that if you don't hear from me, that means everything's okay. Correct. If, if I don't <laughs> like something, I'll let you know, but usually they're okay. Okay. Let me ask a follow-up question. Mm -hmm. So what if we believe that listing is not correct? The problem is these authoritative body ones are done pretty much automatically based upon sort of statute. So even if I didn't think something should be listed, what impact does that have in the decision-making process? Well, um, that's got a two-part answer. First, um, this committee has identified the um, authoritative bodies for purposes of uh, listing carcinogens. So if for some reason you, you notice that a particular authoritative body is, is um, identifying chemicals that you don't think should be listed, then you always have the option to um, change that designation and say they're no longer an authoritative body. That would have to be done by the committee in, you know, um, through a regular process. If it's a listing under one of the other mechanisms, for example, a labor code or, or um, uh, formally required, you can make a comment as an individual on the committee and say why you don't think that it should be listed, but then we'd still have to look at that in the context of the criteria in the regulation and the statute to see if it should still be listed. The surprise see glyphosate was listed under labor code and not authoritative body. That was well, funny. actually the International Agency for Research on Cancer is um, both an authoritative body and a source uh, for listings under the labor code. And generally we propose the listings um, through the labor code mechanism unless there's some confusion or something that needs to be fleshed out more um, in a public comment process, then we can put it through the authoritative body process. So normally we put them through the, the labor code unless there's a, there's a particular reason to, to put them through the other mechanism, but we can use either one for them. Yes, uh, so if a member of, of the CIC said they don't like this listing by the authoritative bodies, we challenge it, then what would happen? Would, would OEHA internally adjudicate that or would it come back to the committee? Well, I think what we would do with any comments that you make on the proposed listings is consider them in, in light of the criteria for that listing mechanism for that particular chemical. So if you say, for example, you don't think it meets the criteria for listing because it's not um, well identified or it wasn't a final decision or the science is not strong enough uh, to support the decision by the authoritative body, then we would consider that in much the same way as we do other public comments. Um, but the other situation is where if you thought that a particular body was making decisions kind of routinely adverse to what you all would do, then you always have the opportunity to change the designation of your the authoritative body and not identify them anymore. Mm. Or, and well, on, in the alternative, you can also add authoritative bodies, which we really haven't done for many years. So. Well, that would be pretty string, you know, pretty severe. I mean, occasionally they might make a mistake. Mistakes happen. So what if we thought it was a mistake, but they were generally a reasonable authoritative body? Could we consider it by the committee again? The chemical itself? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, no, not generally. Mm -hmm. If it meets the criteria for listing in any of the four listing mechanisms, we have to list it. Mm -hmm. um, but like I said, if you if you have a concern about a listing, then then I would encourage you to make those comments so we can consider them while we're b before we make finish the listing process. Um, for if, if a chemical gets to a certain point in the authoritative listing process um, and we determine that maybe it doesn't meet the criteria anymore, we thought it did, but it doesn't, we will take that chemical to you for consideration before we decide whether or not to list it. You just have to write an op-ed, okay? <laughs> You'll just have to write an op-ed. I mean, uh, I'll give you a case in point. A number of years ago when I was first on the committee, we deliberated on trichloroacetic acid at great length and concluded although tumors were induced in the rodents, that they were not relevant to humans. Um, a number of years later, it was listed through the authoritative bodies mechanism or labor code in regardless of what we had concluded. And you know that basically kind of undermines 
I find it sort of undermining the credibility of your committee if you think your committee of experts has reviewed this, evaluated, and they reach a conclusion and then you list it regardless. It strikes me as not really following the recommendations or advice of the committee. Well, I think that the, the issue is the way that the statute is written. It, um, it has these independent listing mechanisms that aren't, there's no hierarchy. So if, um, as I said, if, if, if it meets one of those listing mechanisms, we have to list it. And there's, it's not that uncommon for there to be a difference of opinion between the different authoritative bodies or, or other groups. So um, I, I agree that it, 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 it is uncomfortable. Sometimes it's because there's newer evidence, but, um, but it, it's the way that the statute is written. One more, one more question. Um, oh, sorry, one more question. Uh, the uh, chemical that's being considered uh, on appeal, it was one of those plasticizer chemicals. Mm -hmm. Do we still have to hold on to documentation about that? The DINP? Yeah. Yes, until the case is resolved. It's been sitting in the Court of Appeal now for probably close to two years, but it just hasn't been set for hearing. Thank you. Um, one quick question. A few years ago, Governor Brown was trying to advance some changes in Prop 65 and the evaluation. Is he pursuing that at all? Has he kind of tabled that or stopped any efforts? Is that still moving forward? Well, there was an effort, um, a pretty extensive effort to do some um, updates and, and um, modifications to the statute. As you may know, the, it, it, it can only be changed by a two-thirds majority vote of the legislature plus a finding that whatever change um, furthers the purpose of the statute. It's very difficult to get that. Um, and um, he, he brought together a, a very large group of um, industry and NGOs and a whole, whole group of folks, including us. And um, we worked pretty hard to try and come up with something that would get through the legislature, but just ultimately weren't successful. You know, there was a, a coming out of that process also, um, we've changed the regulation governing how warnings or safe harbor warnings are given. And I wonder if at the next meeting, it would be helpful to for us to make a presentation to the committee, um, because it does uh, address some of the issues that came up in that process. So we can do that next meeting. Okay, so I'll summarize the committee's actions. Um, the committee considered uh, whether or not Coumarin had been clearly shown through scientifically valid testing according to generally accepted principles to cause cancer. There were four uh, votes for two against and one abstention. Um, it requires five yes votes to add a chemical to the list, so Coumarin won't be added to the Prop 65 list. Then the committee considered the um, Section 2700 uh, additions uh, and removals of chemicals requiring testing based on federal and state requirements and the committee um, considered that as a consent item. All committee members present voted yes, so that uh, amendment will be proceed through the regulatory process. And so that's it for the committee actions and I just wanted to thank all the committee members for again coming to the meeting and spending so much time in preparation of the meeting, uh, all your careful consideration that went into, I know we all know that you're so busy, so we really appreciate your input and um, donating your time to state service, so thank you. Um, and I'd like to thank the members of the public for your participation um, at the meeting and for those listening on the webcast. And then of course the RCAB and implementation staff to put on these meetings and to prepare the hazard identification materials as you can see is a 
huge task and um, the staff, I think I've heard a number of compliments about the document and um, that was produced for the hazard identification. So I just want to thank the staff again for all the work on that. Um, so now to you, Dr. Mack. Since they all work for Lauren, it's not pretty, it's a pretty shallow thank you. So I'm going to thank you instead. You guys did a lot of work and we really appreciate if you're doing it. Thank you very much. We will adjourn the meeting now. Thank you very much. <laughs>